Okay, looks like we're live now. I, and just give it a sec for to repopulate. Okay, um, so assuming everybody can see me, I hope you guys can see me. Uh, my name is Errol Zdaga, one of the physicians at the uh, Department of Medicine and in charge of communications. Uh, probably most importantly, it was also someone who went through the residency program here. I uh, started the program about seven years ago, and uh, Ron Metellus was one of my was a wonderful program director, along with the other assistant program directors like Nira, who has been a great mentor to me. Um, the purpose of today is really just to give you a sense of the residency program, get to learn more about us, and ask questions, and, and just kind of get more comfortable with who we are and, and what we believe in, all the great things that uh, that are, are occurring here. So with that being said, I'd like to turn it over to Ron Metellus, the program director, I think you guys all know, and he's going to be moderating most of this. So Ron? Thank you. And actually, Errol, do you mind for just a moment maybe giving the instructions for how people can ask questions? Thank you. Thank you. So for you guys uh, watching right now, uh, you'll be able to ask questions. To do that, you have to log in through Google+. Plus. So if you're not seeing the question uh, plug-in com come up, on the top right of the video, there's a little square that you can click on that and choose question and answer. If you're not seeing that, that means you need to log in through Google+. Plus. You already have a Google+, Plus account. If you log in through Gmail, you just need to kind of click on it up there, and you'll be able to do so. And that's basically it. So looking forward to seeing questions from you guys come up anytime. Right. Well, I want to uh, thank everybody who's joining us today. This is year two of our Google Hangouts. Last year was a lot of fun as our inaugural one. We had no idea what to expect, and I think we all enjoyed it, and hopefully those who uh, logged on were able to learn a lot from it. Our goal today is uh, really to tell you more about our program. I suspect uh, many of you have uh, gone to at least a dozen programs around the country and things start beginning to look alike and we want to uh, remind you what's uh, what we think is special about Stanford as a place to train and really make sure that all of your questions are answered. Uh, so uh, please do ask questions. Our goal over the next hour or so is going to be to try to answer them all and we have a fantastic panel here to do so. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, pass the baton along to our Chair of Medicine who can introduce himself, Dr. Bob Harrington. Yeah, hi, uh, Bob Harrington. I think I met most of or many of you when you came to visit, either uh, in the reception before the interview day or the actual day of interviews. So we're delighted to uh, have this mechanism to uh, allow you to ask any questions about the internal medicine training program here at Stanford in the waning days of you trying to make decisions. We believe that Stanford is really an exciting place to be in, uh, in the coming year. There's a lot going on on campus with regard to clinical programs, with regard to research programs, educational programs. There's a lot going on at Stanford University. And one of the things we tried to stress when you were here on campus is your ability as a uh, member of the, uh, of the department to really think across the, de across the university for um, for mentorship, for programs, for opportunities to uh, to get engaged in uh, in research and education programs. So we're delighted to have you here online. We hope to see uh, some, if not many, of you here in uh, the end of June, and we stand ready to answer questions. So with that, let me turn it over to Nira. Great, thank you, Dr. Harrington. Hi, my name is Nira Huja. I'm one of the associate program directors, and I also oversee our hospitals program. So I welcome your questions as they pertain to uh, hospital medicine or our residency program. I'll turn it over to Dr. Rogers. Hi, I'm Angela Rogers. I'm another of the associate program directors. I am new to this role this year. I moved here from Boston uh, about two and a half years ago, uh, and I work in the intensive care unit uh, and also do clinical translational research um, related to genomics of ARDS and sepsis. So I would be glad to talk about almost anything, but specific roles in the residence residency include uh, focus on research, also on the medicine anesthesia um, residency, and critical care training in general. And with that, I'll turn it over to Wendy Caceres. Hi, everyone. I'm Wendy Caceres. I'm one of the primary care faculty. I actually was also a resident here, just graduated a couple years ago. Uh, the other hats I wear is um, I co-medical direct the Pacific Free Clinic, so if there's any questions about underserved medicine at Stanford, I'm happy to answer those as well as primary care. And I'll pass it on to Kate Weaver, who's one of our chief residents. Hi, everyone. I'm Kate. I'm sure I met all of you on your interview day. Um, it's so nice to have you joining us. Uh, I'm one of the chiefs, so I did my residency here. I'm happy to answer any um, 
questions about residency specifics. Um, I'm going on to my endocrinology fellowship at University of Washington next year. Um, I will be very excited to hear from all of you. I'll pass it on to Andy Chang, one of our um, third year residents who's joining us from Uganda today. Hi everybody, thank you so much Kate. Um, as uh, Kate mentioned, my name is Andy Chang. I'm uh, one of the third year residents. Um, I'll be one of the chief residents uh, next year and uh, somehow internet is stable enough that I'm able to join from uh, Kampala, Uganda on uh, the Johnson & Johnson Global Health uh, Scholars um, Program, which is a very important and very valuable part of our residency. And uh, some of the hats I wear, uh, I'm a member of the uh, Global Health Track, so i um, happy to answer any questions about that in addition to any questions about um, life as a resident. And I pass it on to uh, Eric Moe, one of our fantastic R2s. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Andy. Um, yes, my name's Eric Moe. I'm a junior resident here, and um, I'm here in Palo Alto. Uh, but I'm really excited about this question and answer session, and I think of everybody on this panel, I am technically the closest to where your prospective residents are in the process. Um, I think we all remember what it was like to be at this juncture of your training, so I'm happy to draw on what I remember what was a very recent time and thinking about where to go and why to choose a program. All right. Thank you, everybody, for introducing yourselves. Uh, I will get to questions in one second. Errol, just for anybody who came late, would you mind passing along again uh, instructions on how to ask questions? Again, thank you. Yeah, great idea, Ron. We've had a, a bunch of people join since uh, we first started. So once again, guys, uh, we really want to be able to take all your questions. If you're having trouble putting in questions, you probably haven't logged in through Google+. So check the upper right corner of the screen, and there's an area there where you can click and log in through Google+. And it, once you have, there's a there's a Q&A plug-in. And simply open that up on the right and ask your questions. And then we're going to go through the questions and try to get through every single one uh, throughout the hour. And again, this is going to be just for one hour. So uh, we'll try to get through every question as possible. And that's pretty much it. If you're having any problems, um, you feel free to send me an email. I'll keep an eye on it. It's E and then my last name, O, Z as in zebra, D as in dog, A-L-G-A, -A, at stanford.edu. I hope that's not too long. It's E. O, Z as in zebra, D as in dog, A L G A at stanford.edu. Uh, shoot an email over and I'll keep an eye on that in case there's any issues. Um, and that's it. Cool. I'll turn it back over to you, Ron. Great. Perfect. So I'll go ahead and uh, read uh, questions and then we'll pass them along to whomever is best equipped to answer them. And, and the first one, actually, uh, Errol, maybe you can uh, speak to uh, as a, one of the key faculty in Stanford 25, uh, which asks, uh, can you tell us about the opportunities to learn and do ultrasound? Sure. Um, so for ultrasound, uh, so one of the things of the Stanford 25 uh, is uh, ultrasound teaching. Actually, one of our colleagues, our fellow hospitalist, his name is John Kugler, actually over created and oversees an ultrasound elective where you get to really spend uh, a couple weeks doing just that ultrasound. And uh, there's one of the great things about this program, too, is we have a lot of resources. The program is very supportive in that way, and we have tons of ultrasounds. I personally have had a, a, a mini pocket V scan ultrasound with me for years, and I carry it on bedside rounds. Uh, we have them everywhere, and you know the number one thing is you need to have the resource, especially something like an ultrasound, if you're going to learn how to do ultrasound. So we have the resources, and we have the support to do it. And then one of the great things, you'll probably learn more about this as you hear from uh, more of the members uh, here today, is this program is very emphasize on not just teaching you how to do things, but teaching you to be a leader. And part of being a leader is being able to teach others. And the big emphasis isn't just learning how to do ultrasound, it's learning how to teach it. If you can teach something well, you can practice, you can you can do the technique better than anybody as well. So it's one of the, the big beliefs here. So a lot of opportunity to, to learn ultrasound and a lot of opportunity to teach it and be really good at it. Great. And maybe Andy or Eric as current residents, do you have any thoughts about the reality of the use of ultrasound? Um, I, I think it's incredibly um, rewarding that we're given that opportunity. I think, um, especially, I'm personally, I'm going into cardiology, so it's interesting to me. But having ultrasounds in the emergency room, um, we have V scans um, for the CCU team as well as the general cardiology team, and on the floor, just being able to have the skills to assess somebody's, you know, um, cardiac function in the uh, emergency room or you know, acutely on the floor is huge. Um, very incidentally, we happen to have a visiting. Um, resident here in Uganda who happened to bring a V-scan, so I'm on the cardiology service and it's been tremendously, tremendously useful. So um, it's it, it really is a game changer. 
Thank you. For those of you who think that Andy looks a little tired, it is past midnight, I think, now in Uganda where he's at on one of our uh, Johnson & Johnson sites. So uh, thank you, Andy, for joining us. Why don't we go ahead, uh, for the sake of time, move into the next question. Uh, maybe we'll uh, ask Angela to uh, talk about this. What is the exposure and prospects like for students interested in going into pulmonary critical care? Um, you know, I think uh, there is excellent exposure to critical care here. I think I mentioned this uh, often during my morning um, sessions when you were here visiting that Stanford has a very busy active clinical service um, and that extends to the ICU as well. I mean there are routinely, you know, there are two ICU teams that the medicine residents are part of that routinely have between 12 and 15 patients, you know, a lot of everything, you know, both bread and butter and also transplant ECMO type um, things to do here. So I think in terms of getting to see broad uh, medicine, it's a great place and it, that certainly translates to the intensive care unit as well. All of our residents rotate through both the VA ICU and through the Stanford intensive care unit. And if they want to do an elective in the CV ICU focused on ECMO, LVADs, et cetera, they have that option as well. I think that's one of the real strengths of our residency is that it can be the second and third years are malleable to help people go into the direction that they'd like to do. And, all right, next question. Uh, Ron, can I, I just mention one thing? I'm getting a couple emails. If you guys are logged into Google+, Plus, you'll see a little mini box next to your username on the right. There's a little, it's like nine little dots. Click on that, and then you can find the Q&A plugin. Thank you. Thanks. Next question may be for, for Dr. Harrington and, uh, and, and uh, Dr. Huja, uh, which uh, is, and I just lost it, here we go. Uh, uh, are there any updates on the new hospital, and when and if the incoming interns will work there? Yeah, the uh, the building of the new hospital is, uh, believe it or not, actually a little bit ahead of schedule. Uh, certainly not behind schedule. And right now we're participating. Finished in late 2017, people moving into it in early 2018. So yes, people who arrive in the summer of 2016 will absolutely get a chance to. Uh, and enjoy the excitement of uh, practicing in a new right on schedule. The good weather out certainly helps with that. <laughs> Nira, having been in, uh, on some of the uh, planning committees, do you have any uh, anything you want to add? Sure. You know, uh, just like Dr. Harrington said, we're right on schedule, if not ahead of schedule, and this, the hospital will be state of the art with technology, with patient comfort needs. So, for example, there'll be a 13 foot window on one of the walls. All the rooms will be private in the new hospital um, just to really enhance the patient experience and I even think the physician's experience as well so that there's privacy and having certain conversations etc. Um, there's going to be 2.3 acres of garden and landscaping just to kind of help for families and things like that so just a very beautiful thing that we're going to witness uh, in, in about a year and a half. Great. Okay, this one sounds like a good one for some of our current or, or recent residents. How much does it cost to live in a one-bedroom, one-bath apartment at a reasonable distance from the main campus? Eric, um, maybe you want to take it? Sure, sure. So I think that many of you, um, should you end up coming here, will, first of all, a small proportion will have an opportunity to live very close to the hospital. Um, it's income-assisted housing that's just right across, but as you might imagine, it's quite coveted. So. Um, it's a lottery system. Um, for that, you can get a one-bedroom, I think, one-bath apartment if you're living in a single for something around, I think, $1,500 a month um, and then a little bit less if it's a double. Uh, Andy and the rest of you, I don't know if you've heard um, uh, what the current going rate is right now, but I know that as you get a little bit farther away to nearby suburbs like Redwood City um, or uh, Mountain View or a little bit farther in Sunnyvale that it becomes more affordable. Um, but it's no secret that it's expensive to live here. Uh, but I think that on the other end, even though the housing prices are quite high, um, our Graduate Medical Education Committee has done a great job in lobbying for financial assistance for all residents and house staff to help afford that a little bit more. Um, I'd say that the last I had heard, a one-bedroom apartment uh, from 15, 20-minute commute would be somewhere around um, between 1500 and 1800 uh, a month. I'm not sure that's accurate. Evan yeah. Hall lived um, in Menlo Park for all of his, most of his residency, and uh, that's about a 
seven minute bike ride. Um, he was living just north of downtown Menlo Park and was paying, I think, twenty two hundred a month. So definitely, I agree. Like the closer you are, especially Menlo Park and Palo Alto, it's a little more expensive, but still actually affordable for um, a single resident salary for sure. And then, like Eric mentioned, Redwood City, Sunnyvale, Mountain View, um, <clears throat> and even um, going a little further north in Redwood City, you'll you'll find more affordable housing. And and I should mention too that. Uh, just on the border of South Palo Alto and Mountain View and Los Altos um, on El Camino, Stanford has just recently opened a Stanford um, subsidized brand new apartment building. Evan moved there from, Evan Hall is one of our <laughs> current chief residents for uh, those of you um, who remember him, um, and he just moved in there. Uh, it's, it's subsidized as well, so below market rate housing um, for residents, uh, faculty, hospital staff. And there are currently actually many available units, so it's just sort of starting to open now. Andy, any thoughts on your end? Absolutely. So um, I actually live a little bit um, north in uh, San Mateo, which is about 20, 25 minutes um, north of here, but I like it because I live closer to uh, San Francisco. Um, I have my own one-bedroom um, unit right off the very nice downtown area, um, and I pay about sixteen fifty dollars um, a month. And uh, a couple things I wanted to mention also is uh, that the uh, department and the university do a really good job making commuting as well as um, the financial aspects of it very um, uh, competitive and easy. So, for example, um, the GME office um, actually already started a uh, $500 a month um, housing stipend to make... Um, our cost of living much, much, much more affordable. And um, we are sponsored by the university for free GoPass, meaning that we basically can ride anywhere from San Jose all the way up to San Francisco for free on the Caltrain, which is how I get to work a lot of days. Great. Thanks. Uh, and, and I should mention with that stipend that that is for all residents and fellows here uh, and will be throughout the duration of your residency. Uh, and that was new this year, so we're really excited about that. Hey, Ron, right. if I, can I yep. just add one thing, just to put it in perspective? I know it was a few years ago since I finished residency, and but rent-wise, it hasn't changed that much. Uh, mm -hmm. To put it in perspective, I was paying off a significant amount of my loans as a resident, so it's it's very reasonable. The the program does a great job of reimbursing and paying uh, compared to other programs here, so it's it's very reasonable. You can get by very well. Right. Okay, let me uh, read a question that has uh, uh, gotten a number of people uh, adding the pluses to uh, uh, indicating interest. And by the way, everybody, great job keep, with the questions. Please keep them coming. Uh, uh, so this one says, many programs have transitioned to a block schedule in an effort to help residents have a more focused outpatient experience and avoid the challenges of leaving the wards for half a day per week. Are there any plans to move to block scheduling? So thanks for asking this. Uh, and, and a question we, we get a fair bit and I get on interview day. Uh, first off, let me address with that our mechanism of, of change in general for the residency program. So we have a group called Committee on Residency Reform, which uh, meets once per month. It's the first Tuesday of every month, and it uh, meets every single time. And it's not a, a committee that sits around and you talk a lot and nothing happens. It's a group that comes together, comes in with an agenda, discusses votes, makes changes, and enacts them. And it really keeps things moving and alive in the program. Program. As you might guess, this uh, particular topic has come up a lot uh, each of the last few years. I'd say we probably uh, have this on the agenda uh, just about annually. My uh, own view on it, I am agnostic on it. I have no uh, particular uh, preference one way or the other just with what we think ultimately works best uh, for the residents, for the patients. I think on this, my perspective, and I'll be interested in, in getting uh, some others' perspectives as well, my perspective is that there is no right or wrong answer with this. There's pluses to each side. Uh, the, block, the block schedule, the, I think, obvious pluses with that is that, yes, you are in that clinic for that uh, set period of time. The minuses, I would say, are a couplefold. One of them is patient access, that when you're there, you're there, but then you'll be gone for long uh, chunks of time and the patients don't have access. Uh, to you. The, the other downside is that it actually ends up having less flexibility for things that you uh, end up needing to do, whether that's uh, interviewing for fellowship, interviewing for jobs, presenting at conferences, etc., because it's a very 
fixed schedule. So for example, four plus two, when you're on those four on the inpatient side, you're on those four on the inpatient side and there's not the flexibility to say, hey, I'm going to be interviewing for fellowship over these couple of months. So let me be on something lighter for that time. And then the last thing I'd say is you end up getting locked into a schedule that is uh, with a group of your colleagues that then is unchanged throughout the duration of the year or depending on how it's structured, the duration of your residency. So I think those are some of the downsides that aren't thought about. The upsides I think people talk about a lot. Personally, I'm fine either way. When we've discussed it each time and voted, uh, and by that I mean by the residency class, ultimately the decision each time has been not to. Uh, should the day come that we, we think, yeah, the pluses maybe do outside uh, out, uh, with the minuses, from my perspective at least, be happy to move to it. Uh, maybe, Wendy, do you have any thoughts as a primary care faculty and, and obviously former resident here? Yeah, I think the, the main thing I would point out that's important to know at Stanford is that your clinic time is protected time. When when you go to a clinic, you're not also on pager for the wards, which I think is a makes for a big difference in the experience of of what people have noted to be the problems of having uh, to leave the ward to go to clinic. So I do think having that, I, I I agree with Ron. I don't I don't think that one way or the other is going to be right or wrong. I think. The way that we have it now, because of the, it is a protected time, does have people feel like they have a, a panel of patients that they follow and that they can follow over time. And uh, I think overall it works well. Any thoughts from uh, residents or recent residents? I would say, you know, the, the one thing I think you really, um, you really hit the two most important things, uh, Wendy and Dr. Wattelis, is that you know the the limitation in flexibility has been the the real barrier to switching to this system and and it's been the main reason why residents haven't wanted um, to go this way I think you know we really value um, being able to you know start making schedule requests the April before um, the year and know like if you have an important family vacation or an important wedding you can request vacation around that time and and you're not limited by the um, block scheduling and and that I would say is the the one factor um, that's the one main factor that's prevented us from switching to the block system and I totally agree with Wendy I think there's maybe a misconception that when you leave from the wards to go to clinic you're sort of on double call for your clinic patients and for your wards patients and we have a really well established sign out system um, that works very well so it, it's a pretty manageable uh, the way it is now. Great thanks the one other thing I, I will mention is that we're in a sense a little bit of a hybrid. It's not where you every single week have a half day clinic. We very much do uh, focus with the majority of your clinic time being on ambulatory rotations. So if you're on an ambulatory rotation, you're typically in your continuity clinic twice a week. Whereas if you're in an ICU month, you might have the clinic just one one half day for that month. So it is it we we, we do try to strike a balance, recognizing that when you're on the inpatient side, the the, the vast majority of your time uh, you're going to be spending there. Let me uh, move to the next question, um, which uh, says, are residents given flexibility to attend and present at conferences, and are there stipends offered to residents that would cover travel and registration uh, fees? Uh, let me offer my of stipends. There is an educational stipend that all of our residents get through the GME office. In addition, I'd say most uh, most faculty who you work with uh, that if you have your work that is accepted at a conference uh, will subsidize or completely cover uh, the cost. In terms of uh, flexibility, uh, uh, we really want to make sure that a resident is never unable to present uh, his or her work at a conference uh, and so we go to great lengths to to help facilitate that maybe either Kate or any of our uh, current residents who can speak to that. Um, I'm happy to talk about it briefly. I think it would be great to hear from Andy or Eric as well. So we as chiefs are integral in like making sure as many people get to conferences as possible. Um, it's, we think it's a very important scholarly activity, extremely important um, for future career success, um, matching into fellowship or getting jobs in the future. So it's definitely encouraged. Um, I, I think that, you know, it just kind of depends on what rotation you're on. If you're on an inpatient rotation, there is almost always a resident um, who's willing to cover for you while you're at the conference. If you're on an outpatient rotation and you're presenting at the conference, we'll excuse you for the day um, or um, if any travel time is needed as well. So it's just kind of like a 
conference by conference discussion um, as far as funding goes. Like Dr. Wattelis mentioned, we do get the education bonus from GME and then based on who your mentor is and what the specific conference is, there may be additional funding available from, um, from those resources as well. Yes, um, I went to a conference um, last year and I was amazed at how um, how easy um, everything was done. I happened to be on a um, pretty flexible outpatient um, elective, so um, didn't have to go through um, finding someone to cover me, but it was incredibly easily done. And when I got back, um, basically submitted my receipts and had a check cut out for me um, not too long afterwards. Um, not to mention one of the nice things about um, being in the Bay Area is uh, um, not only do we as Stanford host a lot of conferences um, with San Francisco right around the corner, um, also a lot of conferences I know um, uh, the ACP Northern California um, meeting, um, a very large chunk of our, our residents go to present and do very well at every year. So um, there are a lot of great opportunities right around the corner too. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Um, we'll go to the next question, uh, which is uh, for the, I think, current and uh, recent residents. What do the residents think about the level of autonomy at the three hospitals through which they rotate? Is it significantly different or pretty even? Uh, sure, I can take this one first. Uh, so you're right, there are three hospitals that we predominantly as residents spend our time at, one being Stanford Hospital, the second being the VA, um, and the third being Santa Clara Valley <coughs> Hospital, County Hospital. Um, and to answer the first part of your question, I think the level of autonomy is wonderful. Um, you know, having been an intern last year and then now assuming new responsibilities as a junior resident, I think the culture here is very much about giving you a shot at your level, whether me right now as a junior making decisions on my patients or an intern to create a plan um, to give you a sole shot without uh, any assistance, but if you need help, that your backup is always there. And I think that speaks to the theme that I've seen about the program in general, where whenever there's a need for help, um, it's available, it's accessible, and people are willing to help you. But you also give them a chance to, to put your nickel down. Um, and I think that's really helped me grow especially now halfway through my second year. And that doesn't vary across the hospitals. I think the thing that does vary is your patient population, which is a positive thing because you get to see so many different people uh, from different backgrounds as well as different healthcare delivery structures based on uh, the location um, and, and the way that the hospital works. So um, I really have had a great time and it changes from year to year, but uh, the underlying theme of support when you need it is the same. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, we'll move on to the next question. And again, please, uh, for all of you who are logged in, please keep the questions coming. This is great. Um, so the next question, uh, in case a co-resident gets sick or has a family matter, what is the Jeopardy system structure? I can think of nobody better than a chief resident to answer this one, Kate. I'm ready. I'm ready. This is my, my major comfort zone. Uh, <laughs> no, this is a really important question, and, and thank you um, for asking it. So. We have at any one time um, throughout the year, we have five interns and five residents, R2s or R3s, on Jeopardy call. Those people are on um, outpatient or consult rotation, so essentially rotations where if they had to leave, they people would be able to cover for them. Um, <clears throat> and those and the way we use Jeopardy call is for two main things: too sick to work or family emergency. Um, we take Jeopardy really seriously here. I, I think, you know, the use of Jeopardy at each program is very different. The use of Jeopardy at our program is like this. People do not call Jeopardy unless they have to. And it's great. It's a well-respected, um, very well-maintained system. And I think that people are just honorable. Um, they don't want their friends to have to work for them if, if they don't have to. So. Obviously, we don't want people coming to work <laughs> if they're too sick or if they're febrile. I can't say it doesn't happen. Um, and then we're very um, supportive if there's any family emergency. I mean, we want you to be able to, you know, be by the side of your sick family member um, if that's if that's what you need. So it's really just kind of like a case by case discussion. But um, we have a very robust, supportive system. I think that <laughs> Andy, I know, got jeopardized the first time in his residency by me on the last day of his Jeopardy ever <laughs> to uh, to help some of the wards teams admit. Uh, it's kind of like it happens to everyone once or twice in their residency, but it's usually not a big deal. 
And have you forgiven her? Uh, actually, it was the second time, but I have to say <laughs> that. <laughs> but I, I have to say, it really is amazing, and I think it speaks to the culture of the residency program that 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 it's not so much that people are afraid of using Jeopardy. It really is there's so much camaraderie that people, you know, don't want to put their good friends and colleagues in those types of situations. And I'm always blown away when I speak. You know, and I don't want to talk too much, but I'm always amazed at how little um, our uh, residents get jeopardized and, frankly, how yeah. few times I've been jeopardized. But it comes from mutual respect, I think. I, w I will say, I just want to give one last anecdote. One um, resident in our program, his grandmother just died, and so he had to travel. So I like what ended up happening is that one of his closest friends actually got jeopardized to cover his wards team. So I called this guy and I said, hey, just, you know, FYI, we need you to cover Team C for the next five days. And he said to me just the nicest thing. He said, of course, I totally understand family comes first. And, and I think that's, that's right. You know, we, we're supportive and we care about each other. And, and it, it carries through to everything we do. Great. Thank you. Let me move to the next question. Is there an effort made to alternate or otherwise stagger inpatient and outpatient rotations uh, when creating schedule. Uh, let me offer my perspective. Anybody else, uh, please feel free to jump in as well. So I, I'd say, first let me highlight something that we do that is actually quite different from most programs, which is that we don't have the chief residents make the schedule. And we do this for a couple of reasons. One is that it doesn't make any sense if you imagine that chief residents have gone through all of this medical training, not training to work with Excel spreadsheets and do this giant jigsaw puzzle, which is what creating a residency schedule is. And so uh, what the other thing is that chief residents turn over every year and then have to relearn the process. So rather, we have an amazing group of residency administrators, and the lead one, Karina, many of you probably met on your day, has been for several years the one who uh, makes the schedule, and she's gotten very good at it, and we really put a great deal of emphasis in trying to honor all requests, and the requests meaning about vacation times, requests meaning about I need such and such rotation because I'm considering it for a subspecialty or so on and so forth, um, and uh, requests to make sure that we uh, for couples that they, we align their schedules as they wish. And uh, finally, request so that you don't have a, a block of a bunch of inpatient months uh, time after time after time. And so a great deal of thought goes in, Karina, it's, um, and uh, we send out the schedule request for the new interns, of course, right after match day for the residents. We uh, send it out. Uh, in fact, we'll probably send it out within the next few weeks. And we really go to, to great lengths again to honor it. I don't know if uh, our current residents uh, have any thoughts on that. Yeah, um, I, I completely agree, Dr. Watellis. I think uh, I echo everything that you just said, but I think the other thing I want to say is if something doesn't work out, then um, the willingness of the staff from top to bottom to work with you to make whatever uh, conflict that you have uh, resolved is something that I've never found an issue with, and both with colleagues and myself. It's really been wonderful to know that you don't need to put so much pressure into getting every single rotation exactly right because um, there's a lot of flexibility, and if things need to happen, people work with you to make that happen. Great. All right, let me move on. Sorry, technical difficulty here for the, second, for the moment. Here we go. All right, next question. Along with the autonomy question, how do the residents feel about the balance of fellow versus resident responsibility on things like procedures, codes, etc.? cetera? Uh, maybe as a, as a current senior resident, Andy, do you want to start? Absolutely. Um, I'm. This matter is really fresh um, in my mind for a number of reasons. Um, right before I left for Uganda, um, I was um, on the uh, CCU service um, instantly with Dr. Wittellis as my uh, attending, um, and I think it's really emblematic of the amount of autonomy that we're given because the service does have a fellow um, on and being a um, critical care level, but um, on nights, you as a senior resident, the senior or the junior resident, you're on um, all by yourself. That said, it's amazing that the fellow is available, the um, attending is available by phone, and the culture really encourages um, that if you feel uncomfortable about something, that you should call and never have any fear. That said, if you feel comfortable managing these things, it's wonderful to be able to do these things, to do all the procedures yourself um, overnight. Um, and if you're working with any interns, let's say in the VA ICU, for example, uh, there's no fellow there overnight either. There's somebody at home who can help you out if you need it, but otherwise, you're given all the autonomy you need 
to make the decisions, do the procedures, and um, admit the patients um, on your own. Um, that said, I have never once gotten pushback from a fellow or an attending about asking a question in the middle of the night. Um, Angela, maybe you uh, want to speak to it as well, as well as maybe about the, uh, in response to resident feedback, the new triage role at Stanford that was started this year? Sure, sure. So um, in our ICU, uh, there is a fellow, in the, in the medical ICU, there is one fellow who's in even overnight here. I would say that's a difference from Boston where there were, um, at, the, at least at the three Harvard hospitals, there were attendings who were staffing the MICU. So here, you know, I, you know, there is someone else to help. Um, and it's true that the fellows supervise procedures, but their role is absolutely to supervise. Um, as you know, to get signed off as an internal medicine resident, you have to have done five central lines, which seemed fine when I was a resident. Now, you know, having done 200, you realize that doing lots and lots of lines is really great. And so I think actually that's one of the great strengths of our um, ICU experience actually is that you're being supervised by a super user, you know, someone who's done a lot of them. So that's either an anesthesia, an anesthesia fellow or a palm crit care or crit care fellow. So I actually think in terms of procedural training, you have a super user who's right there to help you, but the, the norm is and expectation is absolutely that the residents and uh, medical students get, get to do the procedures, but with supervision. So I think that works really well. Our hospital has a little bit of an unusual system in that it has an ICU fellow who goes to, um, who helps with the triage role. Again, that was in part done by attendings at a lot of the places where I was here as an attending. I'm usually not very involved in the decision of does a sick patient need to come. Um, and the realization was, you know, that that role of evaluating the floor patients and deciding who comes, who doesn't, both floor and ED, was really valuable. And so in the past year, we have um, actually the medicine residency added a resident to be a part of the ICU each month, to, really to play that triage role and um, be the one making the decisions together with, you know, doing the initial evaluation, initial management decision making about coming to the ICU. And that's been really popular. Great. Well, in okay. general medicine, I'll say we have a procedure team. Um, and so our procedure team is actually for LPs, Thoras, things like that. And it's staffed by hospitalists, but that just means they're there for supervision and backup. And the residents actually perform the procedures on these patients. So they really do get some good experience. Excellent. Okay, next question. How are residents evaluated? What is the structure of the evaluation? I, I think I'll take this one. Um, and uh, this is something we take really seriously, and uh, I'll tell you just how seriously we take it. And I'm going to speak to both how residents are evaluated, but also how residents evaluate the attendings. So a uh, couple things. So like I think most places, we have an electronic evaluation system that is done where after every rotation, the resident is evaluated by the attending uh, with a standard uh, competency and milestone-based evaluation metrics. Uh, the resident also will evaluate all of his or her attendings as well as the rotations. And we take this extremely seriously. Uh, so the, res the ro evaluations that are done for the resident are really meant to be formative and to help them so they can see, of course, all the evaluations um, and we go over with them at the quarterly meetings. Uh, of course, we always uh, really, really encourage the face-to-face -face, uh, feedback such that one of the evaluation questions for the attending is, what date did you meet with the resident to discuss his or her performance? To really emphasize it's not just good enough uh, to put it on paper. We also, in fact, from the faculty standpoint, we follow up with them. In fact, faculty bonuses are tied to making sure that all their evaluations are complete to make sure that it really happens. Now, in terms of the seriousness that we take, the resident evaluations of the uh, of the rotations in the faculty, let me tell you about that. So from the resident evaluations of the rotations, every year our last committee on residency reform meeting is something called the annual program evaluation. And one of the things we do with that is we get rankings of all of the rotations based solely on the feedback that all of the residents have done over the course of that year. And we do it to look at what's working on, on what certain rotations. And for the ones that are ranking low, why are they ranking low? What can we do to bring them up? And we do this every year, and it's a big part of, of really quality improvements in our, in our program. 
for the faculty standpoint, uh, once a year, all of the faculty meet with their division chiefs and get feedback about their performance on all sorts of metrics. One of the very important ones is their teaching and their evaluations by the residents. So besides all of those evaluations from the residents uh, going anonymously, of course, uh, to the uh, uh, division and departmental leadership, we also have a separate dinner. In fact, we're doing it uh, next week, once a year, where we sit with all of the uh, elected representatives representatives from the uh, residents to go over each and every faculty member. We make sure there's plenty of wine at the dinner to make sure all the lips are loose uh, to, to, to tell the true stories. And we get the information back to the, uh, to, to the division chiefs and to the faculty. Again, most of it is very good. But to really say, how can we improve at the level of rotations, at, at, at divisions, and from individual faculty? So we take it very seriously. All right, uh, let me move to the next question. This one for Wendy. Are there opportunities for residents to spend time volunteering at a free clinic? Ah, yes. So uh, we have two free clinics at Stanford. They're both, uh, traditionally, they were student-run, uh, one in Menlo Park and the other one in, in uh, San Jose. Uh, absolutely, in residency, uh, all the residents spend time at the free clinics. That's primarily where uh, a lot of the outpatient autonomy comes. Uh, at, what we're working with is how to establish leadership roles within the free clinic. I think there's lots of opportunities for research, particularly there, and um, longitudinal projects, QI projects at the free clinics. Uh, so if people are interested, most certainly they can they can volunteer even more there. Great, thank you. All right, for the residents, what it is what is it like to live in Palo Alto for students coming from cities? Uh, so uh, maybe for our residents, you can say where you came from and tell us how you what it's been like uh, living in Palo Alto. I came from Washington DC and I have to say I was I was worried. Uh, I was worried my husband was tenfold more worried than me about um, moving to the burbs and that it was going to be boring or something. It's so amazing living here. I just can't say enough good things. It took us about like three months to adjust to the quiet and the nice people and all of the wonderful families and, and things like that but it, it's been it's been fantastic and I, and I will say with the combination of Redwood City Palo Alto and Mountain View as close sort of downtowns um, which they are they're cities they're not like small towns um, there's tons to do and this and San Francisco's close it's like 45 minutes an hour away so if you want sort of a city feel then you can always go up there I thought it for us it was a great change of pace um, really offers like the whole outdoor experience which I think a lot of big cities are lacking in. Okay, thank you. Um, how was travel to the county hospital? Um, mm. Eric, Andy, maybe one of you? Sure. Um, so I live in Palo Alto and so the county hospital, uh, the Santa Clara Valley Hospital, which um, with the hours that you'll work on an inpatient service, uh, you're not going to really hit much traffic at all. So the nice thing um, about coming from this direction, the way we work, going towards the hospital in the morning and coming back in the evening is you're going opposite uh, of traffic. So um, it's really a straight shot uh, on the interstate. You can take I-280 or the highway, but it ends up being about a 25-minute drive in the morning. Um, so understandably, it does add a little bit of time to your commute, but it's not a you know, a banging your head on the steering wheel type commute. It's a pretty quick, it's a stress-free drive. Um, and I think the most important thing is that uh, it's worth the travel to go there because it's a different experience and you're kind of going to a different setting with different resources and different people. Um, and as far as the proportion of your schedule that it makes up to as residents at Stanford, um, you'll do probably on average about four weeks during your intern year. Um, so it's not a huge burden uh, overall as well. Uh, and so I found it really accessible and, and well worth the drive. Okay, thank you. What is the exposure like for residents interested in gastroenterology? Let me say a couple of words about our subspecialty training uh, first, and then I'll, I'll pass it along to others. So uh, we have a 
uh, big feeling that the A, all of our categorical residents should uh, rotate through all of these subspecialties that, uh, that uh, we want to make sure that you don't graduate from residency and never have spent any time, for example, on, on uh, endocrinology. Uh, so over the course of your three years, you will spend all. Number two, we feel it's critically important that your time on the subspecialties not be overly dominated by the inpatient time, as I think uh, happens many places. We, uh, so we made changes a few years ago to say on, for all of the subspecialties, that when you uh, are on those uh, consult rotations that at least half your time uh, be spent on the ambulatory side. For some things like endocrinology, rheumatology, of course, it's much more than that. Uh, but for all of the rotations, so such as gastroenterology, uh, when you're on the GI consult service, you spend half your time on the inpatient and half your time on the outpatient, not the sort of thing of if you have some time in the afternoon, go by the clinic, but rather when you're on the ambulatory side, that's what you are on for the rotation and you, and you do it. So that applies not only to gastroenterology, but to all of them, but maybe I can uh, pass the uh, baton to our uh, current or recent residents to tell about their exposure. Sure. Um, I think gastroenterology is one of the um, um, very well-run um, rotations at Stanford. Um, I ended up doing it as an intern, and I spent two weeks um, on the um, inpatient side, um, mostly doing consults, but the consults, it was also wonderful because um, you get to go and uh, assist, or sometimes um, if the attending is up for it, we'll let you uh, help out with some of the um, uh, colonoscopies or endoscopies there. And then the second um, half of it, the two weeks, you actually spend um, outpatient, and there's a great exposure on the outpatient side. You get to see everything from the super specialized, say, like IBD clinics to general um, gastroenterology, and for people who really want the broad exposure, uh, there's also a hepatology rotation that's separate uh, from the um, gastroenterology sort of luminal um, GI rotations as well. Great, thank you. Okay, next question is, um, uh, have you added new any new rotations in the last few years? And uh, the answer is absolutely yes, and in fact, it's something we aim to do every year is to add uh, add rotations based on the feedback and experiences of the residents. So uh, uh, give you some specific examples. Uh, we added a rotation a, uh, for those who are interested in primary care careers that's up at one of our University Health Alliance sites up in Oakland. So different patient population that you're seeing and it's a primary care clinic that also has a lot of the medical subspecialties, things like endocrinology, rheumatology, embedded in it. Um, and uh, so that, that new rotation was really started because of the opportunities that the expansion of Stanford Healthcare with the University Health Alliance uh, uh, gives. I'll, maybe I'll turn to Nira in a moment to speak about our new rotation next year at Valley Care. But let me address a couple of the other uh, new rotations that we've added and just how different they are. So, so this year, we had new rotations between allergy, immunology, pulmonary hypertension and the cardiothoracic surgery ICU, three completely different rotations, all com all elective, by the way, so this is only for those who want to, so that if your career interest is to go into primary care or to immunology, rheumatology, that allergy immunology rotation is going to be really useful, whereas if your career interest is to go into cardiology or critical care, then the CTIC or pulmonary hypertension uh, rotations are useful. The other thing we do at that annual program evaluation, again, is we critically look at, at the each rotation every year. And so if there's rotations that uh, just aren't good enough experiences, we'll try to improve them. If they can't be, we'll, we will trade those out for ones that are much better. So this is why, again, we really like to have a very dynamic uh, process with this. Maybe, Nira, could you talk about the new Valley Care rotation next year? Absolutely. So this year we actually added a perioperative medicine elective, um, which is uh, an elective in which the health staff can rotate with hospitals who are embedded in the departments of orthopedics, uh, neurosurgery and colorectal surgery and so they're working on co-management of these post-op patients So really learning sort of perioperative medicine in that in that environment and from what I'm hearing the feedback is amazing this this evaluation or sorry the evaluations are still pending for the whole year we're only six months into it but it's going very well so far and then for next uh, ap academic year so the year that you all would actually start um, we have an elective that's available for second and third year residents at Valley Care which is one of our new newly acquired sites from Stanford and it's a hospitals program that is uh, recently started there, and most of the gra or most of the um, faculty who are part of that program are actually former Stanford residency grads. So they kind of know the system. They've been trained through the Stanford 25. They value bedside medicine, and that elective is actually Monday through Friday.
Friday really embedded into community hospital medicine, so understanding kind of the bread and butter practices, um, an environment where consultants aren't always consulted. Many patients just have one or two medical problems and they're, you know, discharged in a short amount of time and it's just a really nice environment to train in. Great, and as, as I'm keeping an eye on the time, and so I'm, uh, there's a couple of these questions that are similar, and I'm going to combine and actually maybe building on, on this uh, point that we were just answering. There's a question, is there a hospital's rotation offered? Any movement towards expansions, rotations, and other local community hospitals to get additional clinical experience? And uh, so maybe we can uh, address that. It'll, uh, another one that, that I think is a good example here of, with the question, hi, everyone, what are some examples of changes that have resulted in the program based on resident feedback? I thought this might be a good time to maybe talk a little bit about the SHAPE program and also maybe if Dr. Harrington can give a sense about the overall uh, expansion of Stanford Healthcare and kind of the vision that that, uh, that, that that the Department and the School of Medicine has regarding that. Maybe Dr. Harrington, would you mind first going on that and then Nira or others can speak about SHAPE? Yeah, so this is, as I've said when people are on campus, this is a great time to be here because of the transformation of, uh, of Stanford Healthcare. A great example, a few minutes ago someone asked about opportunities in, uh, in the GI training program. Uh, within the next couple of years we'll be moving our digestive disease service line up to Redwood City where there will be a massive expansion in, uh, in uh, digestive disease uh, care. It will be around really ambulatory care procedures, etc. There will also be the opportunity though for, uh, for research as well as some of the uh, the educational initiatives. That's an example as we move up towards Redwood City and expand our clinical offerings up there that I think the residents are going to have uh, a lot to choose from. Our overall university just, uh, the Board of Trustees just voted in uh, in December to expand the Redwood City campus and over the next couple of years you'll see the Redwood City campus which is about four and a half miles from uh, the main campus here becoming a real integral part of uh, Stanford University. So a lot of opportunity to get different types of training and a lot of opportunities to get training in, uh, as Nira had commented earlier, in really advanced technology oriented state of the art um, places to practice. Great. And in terms of SHAPE, if you re might recall from our interview day, SHAPE stands for the Stanford Hospital Medicine Advanced Preparation and Education Program. And this was resident created. To, and in fact, I spoke with those two residents earlier this week because we were talking about which direction to go um, for the upcoming months. And we've had really great success with that, uh, with that program. So we added Valley Care to part of that curriculum. And I really do believe that between Stanford, the VA, Santa Clara Valley, and Valley Care, we have covered all the different types of both clinical environments and patient populations that house staff can rotate through and really learn from. In addition to that, uh, the SHAPE curriculum offers mentorship, CV development, how do you find a job, um, working on quality improvement projects, publishing, presenting um, at local or national conferences. So there's a whole depth to that curriculum. Thank you. Next question, uh, maybe we'll start with Kate and then can pass uh, if Andy or Eric have anything to add. Uh, it says, uh, hi everyone, can we hear about resident wellness initiatives? Oh, Kate, your, your microphone Sorry, is Sorry, I muted myself. Uh, Alex, one of my co-chiefs, is sitting next to me, so we've been chatting offline about resident wellness. You always uh, have so. a lot of mouth, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we have a lot of different opportunities. I think well, uh, wellness can be sort of very roughly divided into a few different buckets. Uh, one is um, the social aspect, ways that we can provo promote sort of out of the hospital resident interaction. Um, we do that with uh, intern organized weekly happy hours. Those are mostly attended by the interns. They're great gripe sessions outside of the hospital for um, for people for people just wanting to kind of get together. Um, friends and fam family like spouses are invited to those of course. Um, as a mom I've sort of made it my mission to have some family wellness activities so Quarterly, we're getting. I'm doing my best to get the families together at a park, and all our kids play, and we hang out and talk about the special challenges of um, of being a parent in residency. And then I would say the final um, aspect of resident wellness is what happens when you have a difficult situation in residency, whether it's a difficult patient encounter or you experience mental health difficulties. I mean, people. These things happen to th people in residency just like they happen to people 
in the regular world, and our, our job is particularly stressful. So we have um, something called the WellMD program, which is um, an anonymous support group for residents. It's um, <clears throat> a group that basically reaches out and um, helps residents who have gone through difficult patient encounters. It, the residents can reach out to WellMD, and then WellMD will also reach out um, specifically to residents um, if needed. So it was... Uh, it's it's a really we have a, a lot of different uh, different things um, that support resident wellness. Not to mention the intern and resident retreats, which happen annually, always really fun. We call that we call that intern retreat wine and equine get together, wine tasting, ride horses. It's a pretty good time. I know there's been a lot of efforts at the school of medicine level. I think Angela, you've been a, a part of those. Uh, can you speak to those? Sure. You know, and this brought up for me something that Ron and I talked about once, which was, you know, that Stanford tends to exceed your expectations. I think, um, you know, Stanford really takes it seriously to take care of the people that are here. I think that's true from the student, resident, and also faculty level. So, yeah, if you actually Google physician wellness, I think the third hit you'll come up with is the Stanford Wellness Program, and you'll be amazed to see all the different aspects of wellness that are focused on you know, the physical fitness classes that people can do, uh, the go pass that people can, you know, move around. It's really, it's really takes a holistic view. And I do think um, that working here as a resident and as a faculty member, people are generally pretty happy. I don't think it's just the weather. It's partly the culture. People take care of each other. And you, you feel that um, coming here, I think, both as a trainee and, and there's a strong tendency to stay because it is such a happy place. So yeah, the, the Physician Wellness Committee uh, met for about a year um, and uh, is moving up to very high levels. I believe there's a new um, position even in the Dean's office to work on this issue. Right. And I have to say it's wonderful being on the uh, larger Stanford campus as well. Um, well, in terms of physical fitness within the hospital, there's a program called Healthy Steps where actually by logging your uh, well-being physically um, in terms of exercise, mental health, what you do. You actually, the hospital will actually pay you um, in terms of dollars that could be spent on recreational health activities, um, other things. Um, we have a complimentary gym membership at the wonderful gyms there. We have a private resident-only gym on the fourth floor. Um, little plug, myself and other pre-chief Andre Kumar organize the uh, annual um, intramural football, flag football team. Mm -hmm. So. Um, we really do everything we can to um, bolster physical as well as mental um, health. Right. We won't talk about the, the record this year, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> it's all about the fun. That's right. Yes. Well stated. All right. Uh, okay. Hi. Can you talk a bit more about the innovation biodesign pathway of distinction? Maybe I'll take the moment to speak uh, even a little more broadly about the pathways of distinction, including uh, that one. So uh, the pathways of, of distinction, as I think most of the uh, applicants this year know about, uh, was a uh, project that was two years in the making that we were really excited to launch this year with this year's intern class. And the idea is that every trainee leaves Stanford first and foremost with a world-class clinical education, but that in addition they choose an area from among six areas uh, that we call pathways uh, that they can leave with extra skill sets uh, to go on with the next uh, the, the next part of their career. So that can be in basic tr and translational research, that can be in uh, clinical research, quality improvements, underserved pathways and global health, uh, it can be in primary care, it can be in uh, clinical teaching, and it can be in innovation and biodesign. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into lot of, lots of detail on each one, although there's information on our website. But the structure is as follows. Uh, each one is uh, led by a senior member of the departments, and there's uh, multiple faculty in each in each pathway. And there's protected time each month for the groups to get together and meet. Those are often talking about uh, uh, career counseling uh, and uh, potential jobs uh, focusing on those, those uh, career paths. Uh, there's larger events. So for example, in the innovation biodesign uh, pathway, there was a uh, meeting earlier this year with the 
COO of the hospital to talk about in, in people who are interested in healthcare administration as being part of their uh, career, how that can be. And then with the pathways they also each have, uh, during the three years, you'll have the opportunity to do a specific rotation or course as a part of your training. So for example, in the underserved population global health pathway, there is a course uh, in underserved populations global health as well as a, a, a separate course uh, in uh, social medicine. Uh, in the primary care uh, pod, there are specific rotations spe uh, that are for those who have in career interests in primary care, specifically for those in the pods, for clinical research the same. So that's the idea with the pods. This is year one. We've been really excited. We just had a mid-year review of it uh, with the pod leaders. Everybody's really excited and planning for next year, which will be the first year that we have first and second years in it. And uh, so again, this is one of, one of the really major new initiatives in our program. Um, uh, I think we're almost out of time, so let me uh, pick one last question and then we can give any uh, final thoughts. Um, all right. Uh, this is a, a nice, uh, probably a nice fun one to, to end it uh, for our residents. What are some of the social events among the residents? All right. Well, I'll start. There's, I, I mentioned a couple in the... Um, when we were discussing wellness, but we do uh, probably our two biggest social events of the year are um, the, our uh, intern retreat, which is just for interns every year, um, and then our resident re that happens in October, and then our resident retreat, which happens in March or April um, of every year. That's all of the residents. I think unique in our program that includes um, prelims from anesthesia and neuro. That also includes all of the interns um, and our twos and our threes. Uh, so we retreat for the day, no clinical responsibilities. It's a planning nightmare, but it's totally worth it. Um, <clears throat> and I will say, uh, so that those are two big events. We have our annual holiday party, which is a lot of fun. Uh, that happens around the holidays. And then there's a lot of more informal events. Uh, maybe, Andy, I'll, I'll let you talk about those. Sure. I mean, um we are really, really lucky to be living where we are living. San Francisco is an hour away. Tahoe's five hours away. Santa Cruz, about an hour away. Half Moon Bay, 30 minutes to an hour away. Um, let's see, Napa Valley, maybe two hours away. Um, so there's so many things that can be done. Um, just a smattering of activities that happen. For some reason, every year, the interns end up going to Tahoe in the summer. There is a Tahoe trip. Uh, um, that residents took for snowboarding and skiing earlier this year. Um, Napa trips all the time. So, um, so and obviously the obviously city. City. So, a lot of things lot to do. Things to do. Yeah, and on a much yeah, more on a much more informal level as well. Just, uh, when you don't have time to go hours, a couple hours away or something. Uh, for instance, you know, after I'm done with work today, we have a basketball pickup basketball listserv where. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and send up a message to see if anybody wants to play tonight. Uh, 20 people, just very casual. And so whether it's flag football or basketball or um, all the different outdoor things you can do out here, running, hiking, swimming, um, there's a lot of people who share your same interests. And it's really easy to gather a lot of like-minded people to go, um, if you're free, uh, just to hang out um, you know, at the drop of a hat on the notice. Great. Thank you, uh, everybody. Well, we don't want to uh, exceed the hour that we had uh, planned, um, so uh, maybe I'll just ta turn to uh, Dr. Harrington for some final thoughts from a departmental level, and then we'll wrap this up. This has been a, a lot of fun, and uh, I wish I was uh, matching for uh, a house staff position this year instead of celebrating my 30th anniversary from uh, medical school. So. Uh, you have uh, great opportunities ahead of you. We'd like to see many of you here, so good luck, and please do reach out if questions remain. Thanks, Errol, for putting this all together. Thank you. Great. And uh, so uh, I, I want to thank everybody who has logged in. I want to thank all of our panelists. Uh, Andy, you get a special round of applause. In fact, I see there's sound effects on Google this year, so let me try this. All right. <laughs> Uh, for logging in at midnight, uh, uh, well done. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, everybody, for your interest in our program and for the questions. Uh, Errol, did you have a final announcement at the end? Yeah, just one quick announcement. This will become a YouTube video. Uh, I apologize for the guys, the questions we didn't get to, but we're happy to get your questions. If you want to leave a, a question in the comment section, we'll make sure it gets to the right person, including, uh, unfortunately, Dr. Verghese couldn't make it today. He's in his last 
final push week of coming out with his new book. But if anybody any question, have any questions for him, we can make sure it gets to him as well. And that's pretty much it. Please do share the video with everybody else, with all your friends who weren't able to join today. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. Okay, bye-bye.